Welcome to Can't Knock the Shuffle Season 2. I'm your host, Sean Cantrowitz. If you're anything like me, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume we have this in common, you love finding out how songs are made. The stories, the details, the hidden gems, all of it. Here's the thing. Most artists typically only get asked about a handful of their most popular tracks. Not only do fans like you and I want to hear the stories behind all of the songs, but I long have suspected that the artists themselves are pretty eager to share some of the untold stories too. That's why I created Can't Knock the Shuffle. I take an artist's entire catalog, put it in a playlist, throw it on shuffle, and then we talk about whichever songs are randomly selected. It's like live liner notes with an algorithm in the driver's seat. In this episode, I'm joined by my friend, the singer-songwriter, Estero. Since the release of her debut album, Breath From Another, which she made with producer Doc McKinney and released in 1997, Estero has definitively held the title of Your Favorite Singer's Favorite Singer, inspiring audiences and artists alike with the seamless blending of musical styles as well as her captivating and incredible voice. Her second album, 2005's Wicked Little Girls, continued to explore different genres and found Estero steering the ship by herself. And by this point, she was fast becoming a frequent collaborator with many hip-hop artists, including Goody Mob, Black Eyed Peas, Andre 3000, and Kanye West, whose 808s and Heartbreak album featured a few songs that she co-wrote. She also provided the voice to Kanye's spaceship on his groundbreaking Glow in the Dark tour in 2008, which is a pretty unique flex if you ask me. Since then, she's put out music largely independently, finding her way in a business that isn't always the most artist friendly. We get into that and so much more in this conversation. So hey, let's jump in right now. Estero, can't knock the shuffle. Hello, how are you? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> you know, just trying to keep it together in the uh, in our current uh, landscape. But it's it's good to see familiar faces. It's it's been a minute. Yeah, it's been a while since you've been here. <laughs> yes, I, I really like to have people on this show who have either super prolific catalogs or super interesting and and just you know many different chapters in their catalog. And I would say for you, you probably fall more into the latter category. You. You don't put out an album every, you know, like eight months or anything like that. You're not somebody who just, you know, tosses songs off casually. Right. Very precious and very, yeah. I, I would assume that that's sort of been a process that you've always kept. It seems like you've sort of worked at an even clip. Yeah, I guess it appears that way. I did have a very prolific period after everything is expensive that just the things from that period haven't been released yet. And that's more due to just circumstance of being an independent artist. Also coming from this sort of heritage music business, as I call it, where I was a spoiled kid, you know, that had engineers and was in big studios and whatever. And, and um, my job was really just to sing and be creative and produce. And now um, I'm sort of forced into the engineering position, which was never really, my forte. And so there's been a lot of like learning curve as you, I, you're somebody that's come in to actually assist me with stuff. And, you know, so you know that that's, a, that's a big part of it too, um, from a technical standpoint. And then also there's the side of it of just the pandemic and the worlds and, you know, um, the business stuff and whatever. So I do have a lot more songs than people are privy to. <laughs> like, right. And I have a lot of songs in various forms of disarray. Yeah, totally. And and you sort of alluded to it before, you know, being, you called it the heritage music business. The heritage music business. That was coined by uh, Michael McCarty. It's something that I've talked about with other guests on the show before, that if you've been doing this for a minute, the landscape is just almost unrecognizable at this point, like in terms of the way songs are valued and received. And I know that that's been a, another thing that you've been a huge crusader for, especially, you know, in recent years. Yeah. And also... I was talking to somebody about it the other day too, the idea of just um, like making an album or like an entire piece. Everything has become really just sort of one song driven. And even like with my kids trying to, I have this exercise every day where I try to get them to listen to an album in its entirety. And Gio will say something to me like, well, can I just like put on like a playlist on Spotify? I'm like, no, you may not. It has to be one 
artist one can i just listen to an artist station i'm like no i want you to listen to a full piece you know it's changed so so much and i know that there are still artists making albums but part of me likes it i feel like my music has always been like a pre-mixed ipod like i genre hop so much that it's actually given me it's not so weird that I can put out like a weird punk song that I wrote and then like a folk song and then like an R&B sexy time song. That's what I've always done. And now I'm not the weirdo. Do you know what I mean? Like it's okay. But I also am someone who grew up listening to albums and really appreciates making like a, like a piece where things make sense with each other and, you know, snapshots of moments in time and stuff like that. So Speaking of either being totally all over the place or maybe making sense in a greater context, we have seven of your songs that I have randomly selected. So I think we should dive right in. Are you ready okay. to do this? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm excited. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Song one. So for the first song is from 2003, I believe. Okay. And this was actually, this was a single. This was not actually on an album. And the song is called OG Bitch. That was recorded at the old Death Row Records studio, which became, oh, what is the name of it? In Reseda. I, I forget, but, but I know where you're talking about. And in the vocal booth, you know, it has like the, like the concrete floors and then they would have rugs and stuff and with the whatever. And under the rugs there were like blood stains on the concrete from where I guess they used to have like dog fights and like, like an office with sliding glass doors and they had bullet marks in it and it was bulletproof glass because that's where Suge would sleep, I guess. And oh, it wow. had been shot. Up. <laughs> it's funny actually, because I think this is the same time too, that if I'm correct about when this was being made, the Lakers were in the playoff, like we're in the finals yeah. against Philly. And um, Shaquille O'Neal was recording there at the same time. So in the daytime, he would be there. And I would, I think, show up at night. I think we were kind of like sharing that lounge, like time splitting. Are you saying that Shaquille O'Neal was splitting his days and nights playing in the playoffs at night and then recording music during the day? Yeah. And he... um and what's funny is I was sitting outside. I was a dirty smoker at that time, but I think I was outside having a cigarette and he introduced himself to me and he said, hi, I'm Alan Iverson. <laughs> but I felt really bad because I was sitting in his lounge cheering for Iverson. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, at the time I had a really big crush on Alan Iverson. <laughs> I think I was cheering for the other team like an asshole. Why was this song just on, on its own, like an island? Like, was there, was it ever in consideration to be on an album? I think so. Yeah, I think it was meant to be on Wicked Little Girls, but I had so many songs on that album. I did two songs in those sessions. It was Jungle Book and that one. And Jungle Book made the record. And I think I felt like I wanted OG Bitch to be a single beforehand. Like, I, I know that if I finish something and I, and I like it, I don't want it to go wasted, but it doesn't always mean that it fits in with the piece. Like, I think that I felt like maybe it just didn't work with the rest of the record or the record was too long. And so it was going to get released beforehand. I also come from that generation, too, where people would release, like, EPs before a record of... And B-sides, there would be B-sides or whatever. So I never felt like... When I did something, if I liked it, like it was going to go to waste. There's this whole notion and just the notion about like sophomore albums, how it's like such a, a high pressure situation. And I know for you, you were sort of also doing things differently now on the second album, like sort of working in a different space. So do you remember that time being like stressful or was it fun or was it like liberating or? or, or... I think it was a combination of all of those things. I think it was me, that album, I was definitely really trying to like assert myself and my um, independence. 
I really wanted to show what I could do because the first album I did a lot that I was not credited for. And I was bullied a lot during the first album. And, um, and I was dominated, you know? So I, I think that it was me sort of like, um, definitely like flexing my, you know, like peacocking, like, look what I can do. You know, I did not suffer fools gladly at that time because I had had such a contentious and horrible relationship with the first record with my partner. That was so traumatic that, um, like any time anybody tried to kind of dominate me in any way, I definitely was like, yeah, yeah, no, fuck you. Like, absolutely not. You know, <laughs> I was very, I was fighting back, you know? Yeah, re- reflexive, I guess, in a way. Yeah. So that song, what's funny is because I, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of speculation about that song and who that song may be about. Song's about me. I'm, you know, it's just me kind of my swagger, like, <laughs> I hate that word, but, you know, it's me having fun. I love that the assumption has always been that I'm talking about a woman. <laughs> Aha. Because I'm calling someone a fake ass bitch and everybody assumes that I'm talking about a chick. <laughs> but maybe not. So there's a lot of things at play when I write lyrics. And so if I remember correctly at that time too, there was a lot of like, like LA that LA club life was really popping off you know like when Timberlake and Britney were having dance offs at uh, <laughs> every <laughs> like hour on the hour yeah like super hollywood kind of whatever and i remember around that time the black eyed peas the weekend song had been out and i remember once being in line outside at one of those clubs like trying to get past the velvet rope and they were just making me wait and I could hear my song playing inside. And I was like, you're playing my song. (laughs) Don't you know who I am? It just was so, they did. It was just so like power trippy and gross. You know, you're not allowed in until we fucking completely obliterate your self-esteem first. You know, you like (laughs) nothing you do will ever be cool enough for us. Like it's, and it's so weird now thinking about like wanting the approval of anybody that, some of that song was making fun of the LA kind of club scene and, and others are direct references to people jacking my shit. (laughs) 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 That's all I'm going to say about that. Jacking my shit and my hairdo. Wow. Wow. All right. It's no, it's just me being playful and, you know, silly. I, I understand, you know, if you have the word bitch in the title that it's going to like lean a little scathing, but like it never, you know, it didn't feel like Alanis Morissette, like ragey or anything to me. It, it has a playful, fun vibe, you know? No, it's like that other, like, I'm a bitch. I'm a mother. I'm like, <laughs> it's like so hard. That chick just made the word so harmless. Like it became so AC that it's not shocking anymore to use that word. Shout out to Meredith Brooks. Because then it becomes like a song will have a basic kind of inspiration or an idea. And then it just becomes like a fantasy, right? Like this is, like, to me, good writing is that you can then use your imagination and imagine scenarios and make things up. And so then it just becomes like a playground for me to, you know, like I'd love the, the it's just too bad you carry no conviction in your so-called revelations, your pedantic conversations shed no light. Like, and I get to be witty and you know, shady. And I'm not really talking to anybody, but I'm definitely having fun with alliteration and I get to use the word pedantic and I'm being pretentious. And it's like <laughs> what, what more do you want? Yeah. Exactly. Song two. So this one is actually from the album that OG Bitch was going to be from 2005's Wicked Little Girls. And the song, you mentioned it earlier. And I'm glad we didn't really talk about it too much then, but the song is Jungle Book. And build me a home. Yeah, I'm, I promise you, dude. 
I think it's a, it's a coincidence that like the first one is like there was so much skeptic like there was a lot of uh, uh, speculation about who that was about and then like this is the one that had three thousand on it and then he was gone. <laughs> like this is these are like the little hip hop like gossip songs. Listen, the algorithm works in mysterious ways. I <laughs> okay. promise you. I promise you. But like, I don't even actually like really know the story of Andre 3000's involvement on the song. So I, I would love to, I wasn't going to lead with that, but since you brought it up, let's talk about it. Like, how did you meet Andre 3000? And how did he sort of come to be on this song? And then he's not on certain versions of this song. Okay. So I met Dre, I think the first time was when the Black Eyed Peas and Outkast played at the House of Blues in LA. And I had done Country Living featuring Goody Mob. I was in the stairwell. And I think Big Boy was like, the world I know is the world. Like started singing and he's like, hey family. Like he was just immediately very friendly. And he was like, why don't you come say hi to Dre and whatever. And so I met him then. And then we didn't, like exchange information or stay in touch. But um, I was reconnected with him years later through Mr. Bentley um, when I was working on the record. And I, I was like, I would really love 3000 on this record. Um, I didn't know what song I wanted him on. I think eventually I did. I think I did want him on Jungle Book, but I didn't want him to just want to be a part of a song. I wanted him to love the album and want to be a part of the album, if that makes sense. I just got his number from Bent and I reached out to him and I was like, I want to, I don't want to send you, I want you to be on a song, but I don't want to send you the song I want you to be on. I want to send you a bunch of other songs that are on the album. Because I think also Jungle Book for me was very poppy, you know, like it's a sort of song that like for Janet Jackson, that is not a poppy song. For me, coming from the records that I had made before, it was really happy and, you know, anything happy to me is pop. And I make sad songs for brokenhearted girls, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, and I make sexy time songs. So I have my own aversions to pop music, just growing up a kid who was super into like shoegazer stuff and like Kevin Shields was my hero and, and whatever. So I just assume everyone hates pop music and thinks it's mortifyingly embarrassing. So um, when I did that song, I liked it but it was like a guilt in me you know and I thought Andre 3000 is never gonna think this is cool so I'm gonna fool him with the rest of the bo the body of work and to agree and of course I sent him like melancholy melody and some other stuff and he was like yeah I'm down like whatever it is so I went I flew to Atlanta and we recorded his stuff this was when uh he had been singing he was the biggest star in the world at this point right like he had done this is hey ah. So this is immediately after Hey Off. Wow. And during that time, he's the biggest star in the world, but people really are want him to rap again. I basically take it upon myself. I don't care if he raps or sings, but I love him as an MC and I want him to rap on it. So I'm trying to convince him to rap because I also am like, if I'm the chick that convinces 3000 to rap again, I'm like, oh. I'm like the hero of hip hop. Like, for like, like I get to be like, like I was like, they will love me forever. Right. Oh, you know, I convinced him to rap on it and he was open to it. But it was also the time when most had that stuff on the zen, 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 zen. So Dre was like, I want to do that. <laughs> so really more like scatting than like, like. Exactly. So Dre's like, this is the kind of thing I want to do. And I'm like, okay. So he sings and then he does that. And I take it home. And I understand like, it's very like, it's very Bootsy Collins. That's the, that's the world that he's coming from. It's super, it's him being like, yo, yo. And he's just being like, he's playing, right? He's being playful and he's being Bootsy. And what's funny is like, back to why it's called Jungle Book is because the producers of the song, one of them was a new dad and his like toddler kid called the song Jungle Book because it sounded like the Jungle Book. It had like this sort of like, right? So he was like, Jungle Book, Jungle Book. And then I just loved that as a title. I was like, I can play with that. Like, you know, I can write this fantasy about, you know, everybody can relate to wanting to like escape, right? And like, and this kind of fantasy world. And then 
as we get into lyrics about that song as well too, that song was written very specifically for a very good friend of mine who I adore, who I did not have a romantic relationship with. He was just a really good male friend. And I felt like he deserved a love song. He had been loved by a woman previously um, in his life who had um, not treated him the best and had, you know, and had left. I thought I'm going to write him a really beautiful love song celebrating him and so I said you know she had your head underwater your heart under fire and I've decided she didn't know how to love you you know it's just me writing a love song for a group a good dude that like needed a pick me up we could live right in the jungle stay up all night dance with fireflies it's just all very fantasy and fun and whimsical that's another reason that I thought Dre would be so fun on it you know the label wanted it to be the first single also keep in mind that Dre was literally like the biggest star in the world and his feature rate was like astronomical but he wasn't gonna charge me like that amount of money but what happened here's this has never before been revealed (laughs) this is when people tell you in the business that i'm difficult they have no fucking idea how difficult i really am are you ready for this shit (laughs) let's go so the label wanted it to be the first single and I did not want it to be my first introduction back into the world. It felt to me too poppy for whatever ignorant reason I had young, whatever. I was definitely obsessed with being cool and I felt like it wasn't cool. It was more on the pop side. I felt like it was a second or third single to fucking nail it home. I didn't think that It's where I wanted to be. I didn't want to risk turning my original fans off. So the people that loved Breath from Another, I didn't think they were going to love Jungle Book. I thought that was going to be a much more mainstream crowd. So I didn't want to alienate my original fans. So I was like, for the first single, I need to come out um, with something that's a little more like Alterna. And I felt like We Are In Need Of A Musical Revolution was coming out swinging verbally. The label was insisting that it was going to be Jungle Book. And so I called Dre personally and I said, look, here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell them you want $100,000 for a check. And then you're going to tell them that I can't, that it has to say featuring Johnny Vulture. His alter ego. Or it's going to be $100,000. And I guarantee you that they're going to be like, never mind. And I was like, Dre, you and I will do a million other, like we'll do stuff again. So it's, you know, I knew like he and I were really close friends at this point and I knew that we were going to create together lots. And so I figured that they would just sort of cave and it would like put it on the back burner and be like, okay, in the meantime, while we figure this out, let's do something else. They just straight up were like, nope. And I was like, I didn't expect that, that they would just say no to the whole thing. Like, fine, take them off. Like, not even just for the single, but they were just like, we're not going to like deal with them at all. Like, take them off the song completely. Yeah, they were just like, just get rid of it. Oh. And I was like, he's the biggest star in the world. I think his feature rate at that point was like 100, 150 or something. And I think he was charging like, I think for me, it was like going to be like 80 or 75, like, which was fair. I'm on a major label at that point, you know, it's recoupable, but it's. Yeah, I was co-conspiring with him. Like, I don't want this. I don't want this to be the first single. I don't want it to be the first single. Can you just tell them that it's this has to be Johnny Bulger and just charge them a bunch of money? <laughs> and it kind of backfired. <laughs> yep. On one of the streaming services, the track says featuring Andre 3000, but... He's not there. He's not there. So it's kind of like like when I was revisiting that and trying to like remember, cause it's been a little bit since I've heard the song. It's like, Oh, like, did he produce this? Maybe like, was it like one of those? So that, uh, I'm glad that we talked about this. Cause I'm sure other people. I think it went out on samplers. That's why it's floating around is like Warner put out early samplers of it. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll send you the version. So you'll have it. So this was like the last album. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but this was your last major label album. Yeah, well, Everything is Expensive was independent worldwide with the exception of Canada. It was put out through Universal in Canada. We speak all the time about this. Having been there and reaping the benefits of everything that a major label has to offer, what was that process like when you sort of were transitioning out of that? It was tough leaving Warner. I wanted to leave. Like, I didn't feel loved or appreciated or like they could do what I needed them to do for me. But they left me with fuck all. Like, I lost my house. I lost everything. 
a lot of artists were in trouble because they'd been sitting, I think, in a holding pattern for so long. So people had blown through their advances entirely. You know what a pay or play is? Um, I guess maybe we could explain for the audience, like a pay or play is when if a record label has agreed to put out two of my records and they put out one and then the second album, they decide that they're not actually going to put it out. They have to compensate me. They either put it out or they compensate me and there's a minimum maximum um, amount. So, you know, a minimum being say $80,000 and a maximum being $150,000, whatever it is. So, we all have pay or play contracts and I think we had put out the record and I think I was only in for two records with Warner. It was going to be two plus two plus two. So if they did the first two, they did the first one, they had to do the second one. Right. So just for people that don't understand, and that would mean that if they have an option to not take the third, but if they take the third, they have to put out a fourth. So they had taken my first one. They had to take my second one. Everybody was fucking starving and they told people, if you take your pay or play now, even though you're not leaving, I can give it to you now, but at a drastically reduced rate. Mm. But it means that when, if you ever do leave, you get nothing, basically. So, you know, we were fucked. We'd been sitting there forever. Yeah. And the record had under, you know, it underperformed or, some, you know, whatever I'd taken it. So when I left Warner and I was given that option, like they didn't technically legally owe me shit. But I was also like, my dreams had been shattered, you know, <laughs> they were also supposed to make me, you know, make the record a success. <laughs> and like, um, it's not just business for you. I mean, like you're in the business and, and you're negotiating on your, on your own behalf, but this is also like, there's a whole emotional, personal, artistic, creative, like, yeah. and just also for context, like I was a kid, you know what I mean? I was in my early twenties. I wrote a personal letter to Tom Wally, which was basically like. I get that you don't really owe me anything, but like, and I said it with like, no, no resentment. It took me a long time to get over my resentments afterwards, but I basically just asked him really kindly. Like, and I just said, look, I get it. You juggle people's dreams for a living. And sometimes some of them just fall, but like that dream that's, that was, that's all I had, you know, like that was a promise to me. And now I'm just like, in all of this debt, you know, like I said, you know, you, no matter what your world keeps going, you're like super rich. You run this company. The company is going to be fine. I'm now in massive amounts of debt. I have to sell my house. I'm losing my home. I have nothing to show for anything. Could you find it in your heart to just give me something, just something so that I wouldn't have to lose my house so that, you know, like fucking $5,000, anything, you know, like I was anything. And his response was so clinical. It was just like, yeah, I checked with accounting. We don't owe you anything. Mm. And then it was like, well, fuck your whole life. Like for me, like, I was <laughs> like, then, then started the like super ragey resentment at Tom Wally years of like yelling at him in the shower when he's not there, you know, like, <laughs> It'd be more disturbing if he was there, but yeah, David Kahn said that to me. David Kahn was the first person to ever say to me, don't let people live rent free in your head. Like he was like, you're in the shower screaming at Tom Wally and he's on a jog with his family having the greatest day of his life. Like this is like, <laughs> only killing you. But I used to have fantasies about TPing his house and stuff like that. Um, but you know, all jokes aside now I'm grown now I'm 42 years old. I was like in my twenties and everything was intense and everything was, I can't on this side of things really pass any judgments about Tom Wally who there were probably many me's in his inbox all the time. And he clearly was doing the best he could with the tools he had. And I also just taking the onus of my own youth and irresponsibility and like, I can say I was young, but technically I was legally an adult. So if I hadn't figured out how to manage my money responsibly, how to cover my ass, how to protect myself, part of that onus is on me. I mean, in all fairness, those contracts are not written to protect us um, and never have been. <laughs> and, and are not only made not to protect you, but to be like intentionally misleading and, and difficult to decipher as yeah. well. So, I mean, that's like, I wouldn't take all of the blame there, yeah. you know? So it was a tough time. It was tough. I lost my house. I lost, um, I lost everything, you know, and I was broken. I lost my spirit. I mean, 
To be honest with you, the story behind that record too was that as I was mixing that record, and I had Serb and Ganea was mixing that album. We were in Virginia and, you know, there were people, there were people in the business that are really respected that were saying things to me to make me feel very good and very proud and very inflated things like, if this doesn't win a fucking Grammy, I'm going to shoot myself in the face. Like, like engineers and like people saying things, if this doesn't. And then I had my own record company making excuses for their own, for not doing the job that I had hoped that they'd be doing. You know, I had the marketing team saying things like, don't worry, it's okay that you're not selling a lot right now. We're going to make the huge pitch to the Grammy committee. Like that's going to be the thing is that this is good. The, the story that I was being told was like, this is going to be like the India re thing where it's like, nobody really heard about it. Wasn't really performing, but then she's suddenly nominated for like seven fucking Grammys because it's a great artistic work. And we all went to bat for it. And so they were like, we're going to submit this really hard. And I was sitting at home. I was watching on TV them announcing the Grammy noms. And I saw Kanye standing next to John Legend, who was my friend. John was my friend at the time and who I was just so proud of and loved so much. It was like entertainment tonight. Kanye said, he turned to John and he said, I told you, homie, I told you we were going to get nominated. Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? And it was the craziest feeling because I was so happy for my friend But my, it was like the nail in the coffin of my dead record. Like it was like anything I could tell myself of like, no, no, it's going to be fine. The label's going to just make sure that I get, you know, like it's all, they're going to get it together. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's over. Like it's just over. That was when I realized that it was all just bullshit, you know, that nobody was working this record. Nobody was going to work this record. The record was dead. It was done. That's it. It's done. And it was my baby. It was my first, you know, thing outside of breath. And it was, so it just was like really just leveling for my ego. And I was totally distraught. I was done with the business. Like I was done with like a I developed a complete fear of dreaming about anything because I'd been 18, 19 years old when the first record deal happened and everybody gave me all of these big dreams. And then the label, not of any fault of my own or not making a record or the, even not even the fault of my label, Jeff Aroff and Jordan Harris were running work group and work group got their balls cut off. They just got killed in the middle of, you know, my record was performing really well. We had sold like 250,000 copies worldwide and then the label died. Sony just inherited, you know? And so that was the first time around. And then the second time around, it was all these people telling me how it was going to work out. And then, so at that point I had had two in a row over a seven, eight year, like a decade long period where I was like, it's traumatic. It, it, I mean, it's definitely... it's Heartbreaking. Def- heartbreaking, yeah. It was like so close. And I think it was interesting too that I think it was particularly heartbreaking after that second record because it's weird because I haven't really talked about this before, but the, you know, the first record, I was young, I was drunk, I was under the influence of a lot of shit, um, mainly just the, you know, the ignorance of youth. And I think that by the time the second record came about, I was like ready for things that I hadn't been ready for the first time, you know, the first record, I was such an underground little queen. Like I was like, Oh, what's a producer? Oh, I'm famous. That's weird. You know, <laughs> like, and then the second record, I was like, let's do this. Let's do something that hits multi-generations and is, I want to be a star. Like I was like, I'm ready. I want to be successful. And I was willing. I just didn't have the right team at that point. Where do I send the, we want to send an invoice for the therapy session? <laughs> Song three. 2012, it is the title track from the album, Everything is Expensive. Everything is expensive. written like after wicked after the death of wicked little girls 
it sounds like it. The album itself is kind of a response or a reaction, I guess, or evolution from where you were. So tell me about the song itself. I was writing that. I wrote that with Ricky Tilo, my guitar player at the time, who now plays with Lady Gaga. He's been with Gaga for like a decade. I feel like we wrote that in my bedroom slash office living room area in the last place I lived before I left Toronto to move to LA after the death of Wicked Little Girls. After I was like, all right, it's time to like switch it up. So, and that was in 2005. I feel like, yeah, that was written like right then, you know, as that thing was dying. It didn't get recorded till 2008. It's funny that now I'm realizing the very first line I wrote was, and if I dole out my good name, will you give me the correct change? Sell your soul, sing a song, sell my soul, play along, stay the same, never change. And then like production wise, I was just once it became, once I was producing it and, and even writing it, it was reminding me of like the shins kind of vibe. Everybody loved Garden State. I was trying to make a, <laughs> trying to make a Garden State record, you know? But yeah, I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. And then I thought I could just kind of lyrically grab cliches. All the kids in the hip hop, just raise your hand when the beat drops because that's fucking original. You know what I mean? And like all the girls at the mod club who love the boys on their Vespas. And everybody knows your name and who you are. Everybody knows your name and just who you are, but everything is expensive. You know, there's like this, it's pricey. Your integrity, you know, is valuable. I love the last line. You're like a punk in a bar fight, which basically is just my way of saying fucking predictable. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a punk in a bar fight. Whoa, wow, punks in a bar fight. <laughs> and if you ask me, the kids are not all right. Because this also, too, when this is written, this is like the time of American Idol, Canadian Idol, this birth of these sort of like reality competitive shows where anyone can be a star. And my manager at the time who had been my manager for a decade was like basically the Simon and Cowell character on Canadian Idol. I think it, that song is to me just sort of just watching the world go to shit in my mind. <laughs> it's weird. I mean, I, I guess I would imagine that it's like this for every generation and every decade or, or era as it kind of like passes the baton to the next. But it really feels like for people, and, and I count myself in this, it really feels like for people whose values and sort of aesthetic was informed by the, the ethos of the 90s, as much as a lot of that, in hindsight, you kind of say, like, oh, well, that was kind of bullshit, as you can do with any decade. Yeah. It really seems like the decade that followed was just a complete erosion of all of that. It's like anything that seemed to be like a code or an established like understanding of the principles of art and music and commerce and how all these things works, it was just sort of washed out. Fuck you. Let's blow it up into pieces. That's still a tough pill to swallow. I, f I find we're, we're farther away from the 90s now than ever, obviously. And yeah. like, I still find myself like, it's a very hard... Uh, it's painful. It is. I think for anyone that's like a like an artist, a creator, not just that, an art lover, it's fucking painful to see the degradation of even just like language and like poetry. Right, but then but then I I second guess myself about these things because I'm just like, well, is this what they were saying in the 80s as the 90s ethos took over or like what people in the 70s were saying once the 80s started? It, I, right. I, I suspect and sort of feel in, innately that that isn't the case, that there, that there was a specific shift that happened, but I'm too uh, cynical to fully believe that. Like, I, I'm second guessing myself as they're like, yeah, everybody feels betrayed and that their heart gets ripped out when the tide right, shifts. And, the three, and that the new generation is crap and theirs was better. But I got to, I actually, that reminds me because there's a story that Cree Summer used to tell me about Zoe Kravitz when Zoe was little, we thing. And I think Cree was showing her, you know, like the breakfast club and Cree would, they would have these movie nights and, and Cree would expose her to these sorts of movies. And Zoe said when she was like in her tweens, like your movies are so much better than ours. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> Cause, and she passed that on to me because I was expressing the same sentiment as you. I was like, am I just a grumpy old lady? That's like, we were better. Or is this the natural thing? Or no, I think that we, we were better. Like, th maybe the kids really should get off the lawn. The kids are not all right. 
<laughs> As an album, everything is expensive. Like, what were you sort of out to prove? I just wanted to sleep. I was done fucking making records. Like, I, I was done with the music business. I remember after Wicked Little Girls, I, I left. I went to L.A., you have to understand for someone like me, like I was born knowing exactly who I was and what I was supposed to do. Like I was three years old. My first memory is me like holding my dad's guitar, putting on a concert in the living room. Like I'm a rock star. Like sing. I have always sung. I have, there's never been any shadow of doubt in my mind of who I am and why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do. And I knew that that was, I was to sing. Grew up in a really small town and a succession of small towns and everything I had ever said had come true. Like I was that kid who was like, you're still going to be here drinking and you know, whatever. Like People were like, you'll, you're going to get sucked back in. You're never going to make it. And I'm like, just you wait. Like, I'm going to be somebody. And every single thing that I ever said to anyone came true in the realm of probability. Like, I was born in a town of 100 people in the middle of Canada. Literally, I was born in a village of 100 people. I was born in the Stratford Hospital because there that was the closest hospital. But we were in a town of, of Little Hamlet, a village of 100 people. The next town I lived in was also 100 people until I was seven. And then I moved to the biggest city I'd ever lived in, which was 5,000 people. And then I grew up in a town of 2,000 people. I never lived anywhere bigger than 6,000 people until I was 16 years old and I left home. So I'm literally from butt fuck nowhere. I'm, no, I'm just a kid from a farm town in the middle of nowhere. And I knew who I was and everything I dreamed and everything I said was going to happen came true. I ended up sitting, you know, in Prince's living room, watching a private concert with Anita Baker. Like my life is insane, right? When I think about where I'm from, I've had the luxury of, you know, meeting a lot of my heroes and, and stuff. So when Wicked Little Girls failed, when everything didn't happen, I felt like it was like God himself had these, like, you ever see like when people get like, smushed in the head with symbols and they're just like well, I don't know it's, I felt like the arms of God had reached down and just been hey hey bitch boom <laughs> like, hey bitch is God's uh that's his tagline that giant hands with symbols <laughs> giant hand symbols hey bitch I hope someone creates that animation <laughs> yes um we could we could do oh you know when people do like animated videos to storytellers please somebody do this and I had always taken it for granted because I would meet, you know, in high school, I would ask people, well, are you going to go to college? I don't know. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. And I was like, how do you not know what you want to do? Mm. I didn't realize what a luxury it was to know who the fuck you are until that moment. And I just, I had no idea. People would say, what, so are you going to make records? And I'd say, I don't know. No. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. Well, what do you want to do? I don't fucking know. I had no idea who I was. I was my whole shit was rocked. My whole world was rocked. And I was terrified on top of it to have any aspirations or any dreams because all I'd been shown my whole life is that I can dream as big as I want. And that it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's going to get, it's going to get pissed on. It's not going to happen. So I just was in my, you know, the place I was renting and I, but I, I also have good teachers in my life, you know, who told me things like, uh, sit still and keep it moving, which was basically just sit still and wait for things to be revealed for, to you. But at the same time, get up every day, put one foot in front of the other, keep moving, keep it moving. And so that's what I did. I had no plans. I didn't know who I was or what I was doing. And I had these songs in my head. I had uh, specifically, I had Black Mermaid. I had Gracefully. And I had Everything is Expensive. For me, I think those had been written a couple years prior to recording them. And I can write something and let it go. But for me, my creative brain lives in my producer brain. So once I start to hear production of how it's supposed to sound in the real world, that's when I can't shut it up. So I started getting ideas about how these songs were supposed to be born and what they were supposed to sound like on record. And then when that happens, this is an obsession that kicks in whether I want it to or not. And so I'll be like sleeping and dreaming about like a French horn part and it's loud and I go to bed thinking about it and I ugh, grumpy, you know, back then get away from me. I don't fuck. I'm not going in. I don't have any money and no one cares. Even if I make something great, no one's going to care anyway. You know, <laughs> like I just would wake up. I could barely sleep. I'd wake up in the middle of the night to pee and it would just be loud like a radio. 
And so I made a deal with the muse, like, fine, I'll fucking record it. I'm not doing anything with it. You know, like (laughs) I just want to (laughs) sleep. So I booked one week to record three songs. I called Mike McCarty at EMI. He was president of EMI Publishing Canada at the time. And there was a studio that the artist could use. You had to pay for it, but it could go against a recoupable balance. It was great. It was like 70 bucks an hour, including an engineer in this massive studio with a Yamaha baby grand. It was awesome. I think I called my friend J-Lo, Josh Lopez, who plays guitar. He played for Estelle, for Macy Gray. I brought in this kid named Gabe Noel, who is, I think he might have suggested Gabe come in, who is upright bass, bowed bass. and. Darren Johnson, who is a phenomenal piano player, was the last guy to play with Miles Davis before he passed. He's really brilliant. But I went in with the intention of recording three songs in a week just so I could sleep. And three days later, I had three songs. And four days later, I had four songs. And five days later, I had five songs. And it was just like happening. And it was the most fun I had ever had making a record. And I just had this small personnel. I had Scott Seifer come in and play drums and then uh, Gary Novak, who used to play with Rufus. Like I had these like really phenomenal players, which is that's always kind of gotten my nipples hard, you know, not in a sexual way, but like in it, that's I love a, a, a phenomenal musician and they're my favorite instrument. Right. Like I like to t- I like to just let them do their thing and then I like to go carve it up. So all of a sudden, a week later, like maybe two weeks later, I was like, I think I, I think I'm making an album. And it was all of my other albums were born through so much. Like it was so hard and this was so easy and it was so fun. And there was a lot of laughter. The reason that it took so long, everything is expensive. Maybe all in was possibly three months of work but it was that I was time sharing with every other artist on EMI publishing. So I could only get into the studio on weekends. It took from like 2008 or nine until I think it was done in 10 or 11, but it didn't come out until 12 because then we were like, you know, kind of doing the business side of it. Oh, I just remembered something about everything is expensive too, that I was going to tell you about the song was I early on sent it to Kanye because he was working on, on 808s and Heartbreak. And I had written on Love Lockdown. And since I knew where he was going and that he was going a little more like Alterna, I think I sent him that demo, like an early demo of Everything is Expensive. Because I just felt like he would get that. Right? <laughs> he would definitely get that. And there were no hard feelings. He was like, no, nah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's right. And I was like, okay. So he didn't want it. And I'm glad because I think I needed it. All right. So listen, guys, we talked a lot, like a lot, like a lot, a lot. So you're going to have to tune into the next episode to hear the rest of the shuffle with Estero and I. We talk about her efforts to buck against the current streaming model in the music industry, some of her more vulnerable moments in the studio and her experience working with a certain rapper producer who maybe she just talked about when we took this break. You're gonna have to figure it out. You won't wanna miss it. Listen, make sure that you subscribe to Can't Knock the Shuffle and leave a review while you're at it. You can find me at Sean Dammit on all the social media platforms. And you can also reach me at can'tknocktheshuffle at gmail.com. Let me know who you wanna see to come on the show next. My hip hop game show, The Questions, is also something you definitely are going to want to check out. So be sure to visit questionshiphop.com if you haven't done so already. Can't Knock the Shuffle is a proud member of the Stony Island Audio Network. It's home to other amazing shows such as Dad Bod Rap Pod, Super Duty Tough Work, Fatherhoods, and What It Happened Was. If you're still listening to me talking right now, trust me, you're going to like these other shows. So check them out. See you next time. Peace. Stony Island.
Tony Island.